Section 8 of The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean. Edited by Henry Norman. Love and Lightning by Henry Norman. When Mr. Tate had finished adding up the sums upon a number of pieces of paper scattered over his desk, and had found that the total could not be expressed in fewer than seven figures, and that the first of those figures was a five, his consternation was not materially lessened by the further fact that the other six were all noughts. And as he laid down his pen and pushed himself back from his desk, and looked up at as much of the September sky as the soup-like atmosphere of the city and the little square panes of his office window permitted him to see, he realised more accurately than ever before that he was playing a very big game indeed. He had been a bear for a good many weeks, and here and there openly and secretly, confidently and doubtingly, to friends and foes, he had steadily sold what Bosch preferred until he had reached this total of five millions of dollars, which now stared him in the face. There was no doubt about it. It was a big game. But the mere magnitude of the figures was not the sole cause of Mr. Tate's consternation. He had often been a bull and a bear at big figures before now, and the consciousness of having sold five million dollars worth of something he did not possess was not in itself sufficient to shake the nerves of an operator of his position and reputation. Moreover, he had gone into this with his eyes wide open. He had considered the matter beforehand in every possible light. Something great had been forced upon him, and he had chosen his course after wrestling in calculation, as many people would have wrestled in prayer. He had taken time by the forelock. He had grasped the skirts of happy chance, he had cast the die, he had crossed the Rubicon, he had burned his bridges, he had put his fate to the touch, he had taken his tide at the flood, sink or swim, live or die, double or quits, now or never. It was in one or other of these aspects that his enterprise presented itself to his mind, according to the literary recollection or commercial saw that served him at the moment. He knew exactly the risk he was running, and therefore the vision of the stock exchange with its surging, shouting, mad, pitiless crowds, had already exerted upon him all its power. But there was something apart from finance involved in those seven figures, something before which his nerves were as water, something which made his forehead feel damp as he passed his hand almost tremblingly over it. There are only two things which make real cowards of strong men, conscience and woman. And Mr. Tate's conscience was thoroughly of the kind essential to a man who gathers to himself other people's fortunes by selling what he has not got and buying what he does not want. As he sat there in the safe and sacred privacy of his inner office, with his luxurious roll-top desk before him, its pigeonholes bursting with their bundles of papers of all shades of white and yellow and blue, his eyes rested on nothing more suggestive to the imagination than several scores of tin boxes stacked against the wall. But it was none of these that he saw. He had forgotten the stock exchange. He had forgotten the city. He had forgotten even the five million dollars. And he was walking down a long garden path with a little swinging gate at the end of it leading into an old orchard. And he was listening to a voice which seemed to him more like the music of running water than anything else he had ever heard, and he was trying for the thousandth time to decipher the inner meaning of its simple words. If one only had the power, it was saying, if one could only do something instead of thinking, and thinking about it all day long and sometimes praying, if one could only catch men's ears and make them listen and obey, if one had only some weapon besides one's longing woman's heart. And he had replied with such trepidation as he had never known when waiting for the fall of the hammer on settling day, which might make him almost a beggar. 
I don't believe that a woman with such a heart, if she's willing enough with it, has much to do but accept all the power she wants when it is offered to her. And then he had felt hot all over and hated himself for what seemed so coarse and presumptuous a hint. But the voice had only replied, People say so very easily. And then it had stopped, and he had looked up to find a pair of large, pale grey eyes looking at him, full of wonder, or suspicion, or what was it? This was the problem beyond his solving. This it was that made his hand unsteady and his forehead damp as he sat among his papers and boxes. And this it was, too, that lay at the bottom of his consternation as he stared absently at those seven figures. Nor was the problem solved this time, for a light tap at the door interrupted Mr. Tate's reflections, and, without waiting for any response from him, the door opened silently, and a slim, elderly man entered and closed it silently behind him. He was elderly in years, for his semi-military moustache was grey, and his short, neatly parted hair was almost white, but his sharp elastic step and straight figure, closely buttoned up in a dark blue frock coat, might have caused him to pass for a general in undress, except perhaps for his deferential manner. He stepped to Mr. Tate's side, holding a yard or so of paper tape from a stock telegraph instrument stretched out between his hands, and said quietly, "'It has gone up again, sir.' "'What has gone up? How much?' inquired Mr. Tate incoherently. "'One and a half, since the market opened,' replied Mr. Silk, for this elderly, soldier-like individual was confidential clerk to the great financier, a second self to whose opinions in money matters he attached almost as much weight as to those of his first self, and whose quiet deferential demeanour covered a mine of information and a quickness of brain and a clearness of judgment, which his employer had been glad to profit by for nearly twenty years. Sixty-one and a half now, sir, added Mr. Silk. Do you know how much we have sold altogether? asked his employer, and he handed him the slip of paper from his desk. We cannot sell much more, can we? No, sir, replied Mr. Silk quietly. We cannot. And if... And he paused. And if it goes up for another few weeks, that is what you mean. We are ruined, of course, bankrupt, posted on the exchange. Why the devil don't you say it? The word ruin has never passed my lips to you yet, sir, said Mr. Silk with a touch of severity in his quiet tone. But I was going to say, if it keeps on like this... It won't keep on, retorted Mr. Tate. It won't keep on, I tell you. If you've been with me through thick and thin all these years and haven't any more confidence in my judgment than to think that I should sell five million dollars for a rise at this late hour, I think it is a pity. And Mr. Tate pulled the roll top of his desk down with a bang. Mr. Silk was too much accustomed to these little inhibitions of feeling, which meant nothing to be in any way perturbed. I suppose you know who bought the last lot you sold, sir? No. Leslie bought it at once. Damn Leslie, retorted Mr. Tate angrily. The young fool knows no more about American securities than a Hindu knows about skates. He will live to curse the day he ever heard of it. You mark my word. Well, sir, replied Mr. Silk with more independence in his tone than he had yet shown. I have no doubt you are right. And I had hoped, sir, he added diplomatically, that you were aware of the opinion in which I hold your judgment on financial matters. But I should not be doing my duty if I did not tell you again that I regard this operation with considerable apprehension. We have sold, and sold, in a rising market for you know how long. We cannot sell any more. 
the market is rising still and settling day is not so far off mr leslie has made no serious mistake yet and we know to our cost once at least and he has bought as regularly as we have sold i cannot help fearing he knows what he is doing silk said mr tate rising and laying his heavy hand familiarly on his clerk's shoulder silk don't you make any mistake leslie doesn't know what he is doing i know as sure as my name is tate and as sure as you'll eat your christmas dinner again with me when people won't have what bosch preferred at any price i know exactly what is going to happen but i won't tell you silk he added with a laugh <laughs> you don't deserve any confidences today just go now and see if you can't sell some more before closing mr silk turned and left the room as quietly as he had entered it and his employer dragged an armchair near to the fire for it was chilly for september took a cigar from the mantelpiece lighted it and sat down to resume his meditations but the thread had been broken and no rippling voice and no grey eyes came back to his memory the financier's thoughts had all gone back to the big game he was playing the fact was his life had reached a point at which it was accurately described by the antithetical expressions of which he had such a crop in mind both publicly and privately as regarded his reputation in the city and his relations to his bankers as well as the fulfilment of a hope which was very real although he had hardly dared to formulate it yet the outlook for him was all or nothing the mr leslie whom his clerk had spoken of so seriously was a man nearly fifteen years younger than himself and a comparatively late comer on the stock exchange he had capital no one knew exactly how much he speculated heavily and with a nerve and apparent recklessness equal to those of mr tate himself almost always too during some time past in the very securities on which mr tate fancied himself most and as silk had said he had never yet made a serious mistake his path moreover crossed that of tate at a point that neither the confidential clerk nor leslie himself had ever suspected but which made tate hate him with a hatred so bitter that had it been known it would have been remarkable even among the enmities of the stock exchange in a word mr tate knew that the woman who had come without knowing it into his own life blotting out everything but her own image was the daughter of a house where leslie was a frequent and a welcome guest and the one time that tate had seen them together in the garden as he was riding through the little kentish village near which she lived just for the pleasure of passing near her had left no doubt on his mind what her relations with leslie would be could the latter succeed in controlling them the scene had burned itself into tate's memory as the lines are burned into an etcher's plate they had evidently been playing tennis and her face was flushed with exercise and pleasure she was seated on a low chair in a shady corner of the garden lazily swinging her tennis racket and leslie was lying on the grass almost kneeling he was at her feet talking eagerly to her and far too seriously it seemed to tate's jealous eye for so trifling an occasion and now too this speculation was practically a duel between leslie and himself he was a bear and leslie a bull one of them could win only at the expense probably the ruin of the other the few words and the look that day walking down the path toward the orchard had created in tate's heart a great passionate almost blinding hope and this hope even in the speculator's dull breast had fed itself day by day in happy self-deceit and ever-growing confidence as such hopes will but if he had misjudged this accursed american security and as he faced the possibility of failure all the shame of bankruptcy the fall of the hammer in throgmorton street the desertions of friends the chuckles of enemies 
the paragraphs in the newspapers the wretched heart-breaking struggle of beginning life over again so late in the day all these seemed nothing to him beside the thought of the collapse of this great shadowy self-builded hope a ruined speculator what more pitiful and shameful object was there in the world if he won anything therefore it would be both for leslie he reflected would find poverty no less a bar to love than other men and he wealth and success no less an aid but in spite of his confident tone the conversation with silk had increased his alarm tenfold it was all true as fast as he had sold the stock had risen he could not sell much more he must settle soon all these thoughts ran through his mind in growing confusion and incoherence one consciousness only becoming clearer to him all the time and that was that something must be done as he sat there staring into the fire his head sunk upon his shoulders and the pallor of his face contrasting with the gayness of his clothes and the sparkle of his too conspicuous jewellery he thought how he had cut many a hard knot before and he must cut this one now he was recalled to himself by his cold cigar falling upon the carpet and rising hastily he found the fire almost out the room dark and cold and the rain falling heavily outside an extraordinary resolve had entered dimly into his mind he knew it was there he felt that everything depended upon his not letting it elude him but he seemed too dazed to grasp it or force it to take comprehensible shape while he was leaning heavily on the mantel over the red embers he heard the rumble of one of the last thunder showers of summer or the first of winter and as he stepped to the window to see mechanically whether it promised to be a wet evening he sprang back suddenly thoroughly startled in his nervous condition by a long-drawn blue flash of harmless lightning the electricity seemed to have entered into his very thoughts with his heart beating loudly and his breath coming in short snatches he grasped the back of his desk feeling as though the obscure purpose in his mind were being shaped for him by some strange occult influence slowly it gathered definiteness and strength till at last he found himself master of a great plan a plan worthy of his reputation a plan to force his difficulties to bring forth success a plan which should be crowned with a realization of his hope the most weird of the elements had thrust its own surpassing light into the thickest darkness of his life as soon as he had recovered himself he threw on his hat and coat and passed hurriedly into the next room where old mr silk still sat bending over his sales book tate struck him almost rudely on the shoulder and crying with a forced laugh never fear silk never fear i know he strode out into the wet deserted street if there is any latent poetry in a man a september dawn in mid-atlantic will bring it out at one moment there is night grey and cold and little is visible but the faint outline of the rigging tossing spectre-like overhead at the next there is the haze at sunrise on the red sea line and then great gleams of red one after another like repeated blows come pouring over the horizon until the vessel seems to be ploughing her way through a sea of gold there is an intoxication in the breeze that springs up fresh hopes arise as boundless as the sea itself and the past seems forgiven and all the future fair at the creation of this new day the morning broke like this around the steam yacht nirvana as she steamed along so slowly that there was hardly a handful of foam at her bows but no one on her decks was any the better for it for the only person there was wholly occupied by something at his feet he was a short stout man with a dark red face and heavy curling beard that come from exposure to the salt winds dressed in the familiar smooth blue suit and peak cap of an officer and the lines of braid round his arm showed him to be a captain his hands were buried in his pockets and he was swinging gently up and down from the vibration of the steel hawser 
upon which he was standing midway between the capstan to which it was attached and the hawse pipe through which it ran into the sea on this hawser his eyes were fixed and no child was ever more engrossed by its seesaw than was this bronzed seaman by the movement of his rope after a while he looked up glanced round the horizon and gently blew the little silver whistle that hung at his buttonhole an officer stepped out instantly from behind the canvas sheltered corner of the bridge and in response to the sign of the hand which the other made him rang the electric signal communication with the wheelhouse the nirvana began at once to swing slowly round and in a few minutes she was steaming directly back again over the course she had just travelled ten minutes afterward a man stepped briskly from the companionway on to the deck and extended his arms as he took in a deep draught of the fresh morning air and then cast a quick glance round the ship it was mr tate not as he was in his office in throgmorton street but dressed in a smart suit of blue and with a little peaked gold-laced cap perched on the top of his head the salt winds too had blown the cobwebs from his head and some of the lines from his face for his haggard and anxious look had given place to an expression so cheerful as almost to seem reckless and a week at sea had tanned the paleness from his face catching sight of the skipper still seesawing on the hawser he went up to him with a hearty good morning mr lilburn any nibbles yet nothing sir replied the skipper cheerily the fish don't bite this morning but why ever aren't you using a dynamometer exclaimed tate as he suddenly became aware that the skipper was bobbing gently up and down the sole of my foot sir said the skipper with a laugh is better than any dynamometer that ever was turned out i should feel it if we hooked a sprat well all right you know only don't let us miss it are you quite sure about the position where are we exactly we are just over the spot sir i am quite sure of my ground latitude fifty degrees twenty two minutes thirty seconds north longitude nine degrees thirty four minutes twenty seconds west well the sooner it is over and we are off south the better for us all said tate you know we reckoned upon picking it up either yesterday or today yes sir and we shall do it was the confident answer have the crew any suspicion of what we are doing not the slightest sir i have kept them below as much as possible and you need not fear about the first and second officers after what you said to them yesterday yes remarked tate with a self-satisfied smile i thought that offer would fix them and king too i have squared him pretty completely is he already sir for any moment ah here he comes a tall thin man with stooping shoulders and straggling black beard joined the group and raised his hat to the owner good morning mr king said tate the skipper was just asking if you are ready to begin at any moment i have been quite ready sir was the reply any time for the last twenty-four hours that's all right said tate you know everything will depend on you at the last moment i'm getting rather anxious about the affair myself and i wish we could catch the fish while we have got such fine weather the words were hardly out of his mouth before the skipper sprang from the hawser with such suddenness as almost to upset tate who staggered back along the deck we've hooked it he shouted and two shrill notes on his whistle brought the officer on the bridge in a moment to the electric signal which he rang violently and the engines of the nirvana stopped mr king had disappeared before tate had time to explain breathlessly have you got it are you sure no fear replied the skipper and turning to the boatswain whom the whistle had brought he cried sharply all hands on deck quick now sir turning to tate the time has come and you've got to tell them remember sailors don't understand long speeches come straight to the point tate paled slightly and his hands twitched nervously inside his coat pockets 
as a crowd of seamen came running up in twos and threes until there was a score of them. Now, my lads, said the captain, the owner has got something to say to you. Tate walked slowly across the deck and leaned against the capstan. Men, he said, oblige me by just listening carefully for a couple of minutes. When you shipped for this voyage on board my yacht, you knew there was something more than ordinary pleasuring to be done. You wouldn't have got the pay you are getting if there had not been. Now the time has come when you will learn what it is, and all I have to say to you is simply this. Whatever you see during the next two hours, you forget it just as quick as you can, and forget it so well that long before we sight land again, you won't know you ever saw it. When you are paid off, every man who has completely forgotten anything out of the common that has happened on this voyage will get ten pounds from the skipper to take home to his wife. Do you all understand? The sailors looked at the masthead, and then at their boots, and then at each other, and a broad grin spread slowly over their faces. At last the spokesman of the crew gave a hitch to his trousers and said, Thank you, sir. I think there's no difficulty in understanding of you. There never was a crew with such poor memories as us. That's all right, then, exclaimed the captain sharply, and the seamen slowly dispersed. The operation that followed took a long time to execute, but takes only a few words to tell. Tate's yacht was an admirably furnished one, and everything that nautical ingenuity or need could suggest and money could buy was on board, and there were few of the fashionable European ports where her outline was not known to the harbour master. But no luxurious private yacht had ever been engaged before on such a job as this. For half an hour, the steam capstan went slowly round, and the hawser came gradually on board, till at last, amid intense excitement, the shank of a grappling iron appeared at the surface, and, a moment later, a black, snake-like thing, as thick as a man's wrist, disappearing into the water at each end, was hauled to the ship's side, firmly hooked by one of the five prongs. It was an Atlantic cable. As quickly as possible, it was made fast with chains forward and aft, the crew working at the difficult job as unconcernedly as if they had been on a cable ship all their lives. Hardly was this accomplished before Mr. King appeared at the head of the companionway, followed by two seamen, each of whom held a large coil of gutter percha covered wire on his arm, uncoiling it as he went until he reached the ship's side. The skipper produced a fine-toothed saw, which he had evidently held in readiness, and, with hands trembling with excitement, Mr. King lay down flat on the deck, and, reaching over the side, sawed away at the cable until, in two places, he had laid bare the copper vein along which the pulses of the old world and the new beat in common. At two points, a couple of feet apart, he attached the wires leading into the cabin to the core of the cable. Then, rising to his knees, he took from the boatswain's hands a ship's axe, and, turning for a moment with a faint smile to Tate, who was standing by as pale as a ghost, he lifted the axe, poised it for a moment to take accurate aim, and let it fall gently on the centre of the copper wire, cutting it clean in two. The two loose ends of the cable, being firmly lashed by the chains, had hardly given an inch. Having satisfied himself that all was right, King sprang to his feet and hurried below, followed by Tate and the skipper, the first officer remaining on deck to keep guard over the strange fish. The scene in the cabin, to which the three men rapidly made their way, was a curious one. It was a room usually consecrated to the ladies' use when Tate took his friends for pleasure trips. But now one end of it was blocked up with a score of Siemens Halska batteries, stacked one upon another with their forty wires twisted together and running under the table. The tabletop was a mass of brass and ebony, twenty or thirty black keys all in a row, each surrounded by its little group of satellites in the shape of brass binding screws. At one end of it stood a round black instrument, like a miniature lighthouse, 
from a lamp in the middle a thin finger of bright light pointed across the room and at the other end a long oblong piece of ground glass was balanced upon a little pedestal a mysterious enough apparatus to most people no doubt but not to an electrician like mr king and still less to sir william thompson who invented it for the whole arrangement was nothing more than the familiar mirror galvanometer the moment king had reached the stateroom he had drawn the curtains over the portholes and by the time the others were well inside the room he had adjusted several of his screws and was seated at the table before a sheet of paper with a pencil in his hand intently watching the little finger of light dancing backward and forward upon the oblong glass what is it asked tate under his breath for a few moments the electrician made no reply then he read off slowly speaking sheffield yesterday randolph churchill declared time come when absolutely necessary sound healthy political doctrines be placed before electors press message going through ah we're all right here comes a late stock message and he read out a dozen quotations of well-known stocks and their prices in new york which were being cabled to a great city broker in one minute now sir he added turning to tate who at once unbuttoned his coat and putting his hand into his breast pocket produced a sheet of note paper which he unfolded and laid upon the table before king a moment after the electrician snapped the switch with his left hand and began to work rapidly the large moors key upon which his right hand had been lying for several minutes nothing was heard in the cabin except the monotonous tick 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 of the lever this is what the sounds meant to the man who read them off on the french coast and passed them on to an office almost touching the bank of england new york one thirty five p m financial news of most startling character just telegraphed from west treasurer of watbosch and allied railroads man of high reputation implicitly trusted by all parties fled canada last night private investigation his accounts today shows not only enormous defalcations but astounding condition watbosch railroad itself which may be considered practically insolvent this state things been concealed by treasurer for long period in order to extricate himself from private speculations receipt this news has caused panic in wall street what bosch dropped twenty-five in half hour holders getting out at any price two members stock exchange committee leave to-night for west news entirely unexpected created general consternation effect on stocks be much worse to-morrow that's all said mr king as he snapped the switch back to its first position what is it done exclaimed tate astounded all done was the reply i put it through after the last stock message and now i have just told the american end to repeat last message that is the one he has been sending here while i had cut him off he will think you know that they couldn't understand it and won't suspect anything wrong now the sooner we get out of this the better the three men returned instantly to the deck and mr king began the difficult task of splicing half a dozen yards of cable to the two severed ends lashed alongside it was a long job and darkness had almost set in before it was accomplished at last however the cable was sound again and very gently it was lowered down the side and then slipped when it was well below the surface the captain stood by the rail with his eyes fixed upon the water and the moment a sudden stream of bubbles to the surface told him all was adrift he wheeled round and said quickly to the officer standing near him full speed ahead keep her sou'west half south the bell of the electric signal rang loudly in the engine room and the nirvana was on her way to the blue skies and smooth waters of the mediterranean in his private stateroom below tate sat motionless 
his hands clinched upon the arms of his easy chair and his eyes gazing absently before him for the first time since the inspiration of the lightning had revealed the element which alone seemed able to overthrow all the difficulties facing him he was near breaking down and remembered with something of horror the seven years transportation to which he had rendered himself liable by breaking a cable in less than a hundred fathoms of water but no weakness now he reflected with relief could interfere with the execution of his scheme his crew had all been heavily bribed and he believed their silence could be depended upon the cable had been found cut and the bogus message sent exactly as he had planned mr silk had been carefully instructed to buy instantly every dollar of what bosch preferred he could get as soon as the long expected fall in price should come the pretended news had been carefully timed to reach london so shortly before the closing of the market as to allow plenty of time to operate but not enough to cable to new york for confirmation leslie would be deceived and would sell largely at once facing the ruinous loss rather than holding back with the apparent certainty of still greater loss next day and from these reflections tate's thoughts gradually passed so near is grandeur to our dust to an old orchard and a voice as musical as running water and in the soft light of deep grey eyes he saw the reward of all his desperate scheming and the fulfilment of his heart's exalted hope as the clock of st james's palace struck midday on the saturday a fortnight after the flash of lightning had brought inspiration into tate's troubled brain charles leslie was just throwing the last things into a portmanteau in his chambers in pall mall he had packed in a hurry and his bedroom was strewn in the delightful recklessness of bachelordom with boots and clothes and linen that he did not want for saturday was always a busy day for him and rarely indeed did he leave the sordid city till a much later hour as he pushed aside the curtains at the end of the little passage that separated his rooms and entered rapidly carrying his pack portmanteau no one who had not seen him on change would have taken him for a city man but rather for an athletic young university professor or perhaps for a particularly studious officer on leave for his pale clean-shaved face and broad forehead seemed all the paler by contrast with his black hair and slight moustache showed signs of thought rather than the lines and hatchings drawn by the worry and ceaseless anxiety of the speculator he knew how to dress too and as he stood by the mantel filling his cigar case wearing a tweed suit of the mixture which cockney tailors call heather with an eastern handkerchief tied in a big knot at his throat tall and stoutly built few men and fewer women would have hesitated to pronounce him an unusually fine specimen of a man but leslie had good reasons for looking his best today as he took up his hat and coat and drove off to victoria on his way to the heart of kent hugh ambridge esq j p was a country gentleman of the kind which without being exactly old-fashioned is becoming rare his family had owned the same place and lived on it for generations their income had been small compared with the extent of the land which went by their name but until late years it had always been about the same a few of their distant relatives were distinguished people and when they chose to renew the festivities which ambridge hall had known when its bricks were bright red and the big oaks which surrounded it now were pushing young saplings the guests esteemed themselves fortunate and preserved the occasion in their memories the present head of the family was a fine old gentleman with grey hair and whiskers and jolly round face he always wore a tweed suit till dinner time and he stopped to crack a joke with every man big or little on the countryside but familiarity with him bred nothing but respect and you might have lived for years among people who had known him all his life without hearing an unkind thing about him for he had never looked at anybody otherwise than straight in the eye he had never told a lie he had never betrayed a friend and he had never said a disrespectful word to a woman perhaps after all he was old-fashioned for the men and manners of this latest age were not often to his mind 
in his case as in the case of most men who without thanking god for it are better than their fellows chercher la femme would have indicated the source of his qualities as those knew well whose memories went back to the days when young ambridge and his wife riding together were the prettiest and welcomest sight for miles round for years he had been a widower loyally and frankly transferring all his love from the dead to the living his only child edith to whom in childhood he had been a playmate in girlhood a companion and friend and upon whom in her early womanhood he was now beginning to wait like a lover on this saturday after lunch he had walked over to the stables to inspect a horse that had been offered him for her use and he was just passing his hand critically down the animal's forelegs when the rattle of wheels was heard and the dog-cart which he had sent to meet leslie drove into the yard mr ambridge and leslie were good friends for the older man saw in the younger something of his own past and the younger looked up to the older with the hope that as years passed he might grow to resemble him more and more. "'Hello, Leslie!' cried Mr. Ambridge heartily. "'Glad to see you, my boy. Glad to see you.' "'Thank you, sir,' said Leslie, jumping to the ground and grasping the big hand of his host. "'I only just caught the train. Very difficult to leave the city so early, you know.' "'Pshaw!' You young fellows with money on the brain seem to think fourpence wouldn't buy a pint of ale unless you spent half the day shouting one another's heads off. But have you had any lunch? Yes, sir, I had something on the way down. Well, there's nobody in the house and I shall be busy here for an hour, so you'd better take one of the dogs and the gun that I've put out for you in the hall and walk round the spinney. He'll be sure to knock over a rabbit or two and perhaps get a bird on the way. Leslie hesitated a moment for what reason Mr. Ambridge guessed perfectly. So he added quietly, I don't know where Edith is. I dare say she's walked over to the spinney. Leslie's hesitation disappeared instantly and he turned and crossed the tennis lawn into the house. A few minutes later, he came out again with a gun under his arm and stopping at the stables to pick up a dog he took a short cut to the spinney through the garden and down a long path leading by a little swinging gate into an old orchard as he walked across the fields leslie looked anxiously in all directions it was not for the rabbits however for he had only brought the gun as an excuse for going off at once by himself but rather because the last time he had been to ambridge hall had been the day in his life to be marked by a red rubric the day which not to have lived is not to have known the chief thing that makes men better than beasts and which nothing neither years nor lies nor tears can ever efface from the mind of one to whom it has come in its fullness it had been the day on which leslie had first known that he loved and first believed that he was loved in return and he was now looking with beating heart for Edith Ambridge that another meeting might reveal to him whether it was a fleeting mirage he had seen or a real glimpse of green pastures and still waters. Not that any words of love had passed between them, or indeed any sign or symptom that could be told and weighed, only some of those minutest impalpable testimonies which are as heavy as lead in love's scales. It had been on the day of a country gathering, and there had been a dance in the evening at the hall. But whether it was that she crept an imperceptible shade closer within his arm, or whether it had been a touch of the hand, or whether again it had been that subtlest tie of all, the absolute physical harmony of rhythmic movement in a perfect waltz. Leslie was fortunate in not being enough of a psychologist to tell, but whatever the source of his knowledge and belief they were confirmed by one brief look exchanged as he and miss ambridge said good night when all the guests had gone this was all that had passed between them to make the heart of either beat faster at the thought of the other but it was enough for if there is one heresy more wrong than another 
among all the miserable axioms handed down from generation to generation to make young hearts untrue, it is the one which tells that love steals in with no more heralding than a thief in the night, and that they cannot, of themselves, recognize his presence. Leslie knew that a communication of an infinite content had passed between him and his old friend's daughter, and he looked forward with keenly mingled hope and dread to their next meeting. It could not conclude, he was sure, without confirming or uprooting his own hopes, and with them the happiness and the worth of his life. He looked across the fields, however, in vain. Nobody was visible but a boy scaring crows and a farm labourer mending a gap in the hedge. He reached the spinney and that too seemed deserted, so he leaned his gun against the gate and strolled down to the side of the brook running halfway round the wood and began to gather the dainty harebells that grew along its edge. He was very happy, the flowers were plentiful and seemed to suit his mood, and he had a large double handful of them before he stood upright again. He looked back to see where he had left his gun, and there, standing smiling beside it, stood the figure he had been looking for so eagerly a little while before. Edith Ambridge was tall and slight and very fair, and much riding had made her straight and graceful. Her large, pale grey eyes looked out from behind dark lashes, and the masses of her bright hair had once been not inaptly likened to coiled sunshine, by a too enthusiastic admirer, for she had had many admirers, and almost as many lovers, if the word does not imply reciprocity. But her heart had found a place for none of them, and it used to be said that she kept a little book in which she entered the date and circumstances of all her offers of marriage. How many men figured in that undesirable memory no one knew, Everybody of the neighbourhood, however, could name half a dozen without difficulty. As soon as she saw Leslie spring up the bank, she walked toward him, half shy and half stately. One of her rejected admirers, having nothing to lose, had once told her miserably that she went through a room full of company to reach the hostess, like a peacock through a barnyard, and it was really not a bad simile. Leslie, at any rate, was so much affected by her approach that he clean forgot all the formulas of greeting which he had cunningly prepared to say neither too little nor too much. He simply took off his hat before he reached her and exclaimed, Oh, Miss Ambridge, I beg your pardon for not seeing you before. I have been looking everywhere for you. I did not think you would come so early, Mr. Leslie, said the lady with a smile, possibly at her own tact in conveying at once so little and so much. You've been busy she continued, glancing at Leslie's flowers. Yes, replied Leslie, I've been gathering them for you. They are the sweetest flowers of all to me, and I like them because so few people care for them, and they fade so soon. Do you know what they mean? he added quickly, with a sudden and desperate resolution. No. May I tell you, he said in a low voice, the harebell for his stainless azure hue claims to be worn by none, but those are true. Leslie paused a moment, and then, holding out his bunch of pale flowers, he continued in a voice that trembled in spite of all his efforts to control it. Will you take them, Miss Ambridge? Edith Ambridge had heard him with a smile, but it suddenly faded away at the tone of his last words, and her eyes fell before his earnest gaze. They had walked back to the gate by this time, and she leaned upon it with both hands and looked away over the fields to the fast reddening sky in the west. But she made no reply, and Leslie knew that having said so much, he must say all. I ought not to have spoken to you so, Miss Ambridge, he said simply and bravely. There was something I should have said first, and if you tell me I ought not to have spoken at all, I shall ask you to forgive me, but I can't meet you again as in the old days. They seem far away already. For a year now, I have waited for this moment just to tell you that one word from you will be all the world to me, that I have tried myself in every way I know, and that the love that has grown up in my heart through all these happy, too happy 
days here is the deepest and strongest and best part of my life and will last as long as I live. I can't bring myself to say it. It sounds to me like such presumption, but, oh, I love you with as faithful a love as ever a man has felt. To be with you, to hear you speak, to touch your hand, if I could only make you understand what it has been to me. If you will trust me, my whole life shall be one loving service. I know what you will say, the city, but I like it no better than you. I will give it up. I don't need to do it for the sake of money, and I will never go near it again if you will lead me away. My life is in your hands. Will you direct it? Body and soul, I am yours. I can't say what I mean, but... Will you take my flowers now? For a few moments, Edith Ambridge stood motionless, gazing absently before her, as if the golden clouds had shaped themselves into an entrancing vision. Then she turned slowly to Leslie, her sweet eyes filled with all the splendor of the open heaven she had seen, and held out her hands. Leslie placed his flowers in them, and falling upon his knee, he kissed them reverently with bowed head, Edith, my love, my love. There was no more brook and spinney, no more green field and golden sky. Nature had added to her picture the one element without which, as a wonderful passage of Heine puts it, water is but wet and wood fit for burning. Two more hearts had found the one best thing life can give, and the eternal transformation had taken place again. In the evening, half a dozen men who had been at a dinner party at Ambridge Hall were playing a last game at billiards. Leslie had only just come upstairs and had tried in vain to escape taking a cue. Old Mr. Ambridge was at his merriest, for he was happy at what had happened in his library just before dinner, and every time he passed Leslie, he gave him a playful dig with his finger or whispered a word or two in his ear. "'Come, Leslie!' he exclaimed at last with a comical smile. Cheer up, my boy. How serious you are tonight. Has something gone wrong with the bulls today? No, sir, replied Leslie, taking up the joke. One bull, at least, has made his fortune today, to my knowledge. Now, Leslie, exclaimed the sporting parson of the neighborhood as Leslie was preparing to make a difficult stroke. I'll wager you a box of cigars you don't score. All right replied Leslie, bending over the table. As he spoke, a servant quietly opened the door and glanced round the room. He went across to speak to Leslie, but seeing the latter about to make a shot, he waited behind him. "'Told you so!' cried the parson when the stroke proved a bad miss. "'Cabanas, please!' Leslie smiled and turned away from the table. As he did so, the servant stepped forward. "'Telegram for you, sir!' Leslie picked it up, and with a hasty, "'Excuse me!' to his host, tore open the envelope and glanced at the pink sheet. He read it intently for a minute, then folded it slowly and put it in his pocket. He had turned pale, and a strange look had come into his face, but nobody noticed it except Mr. Ambridge. "'What is it, Leslie?' he said in a low voice. "'Nothing bad?' "'I hardly know,' replied Leslie. Then, in a louder tone, he added, would you mind taking my cue for a few minutes, Mr. Ambridge? I think I must send an answer to this. He left the room and went downstairs to the library. As soon as he was alone, he took out the message again and read it carefully. It was from his chief clerk and ran as follows. Message from New York announces extensive defalcations and flight of Treasurer Watbosch Railroad. Road said to be insolvent reports great consternation in wall street preferred stock dropped twenty five in half hour in your absence could do nothing leslie read this message many times then he turned quickly and rang the bell tell the housekeeper i should like to see her for a moment at once if possible he said to the servant who answered it will you have the kindness mrs herring he said when that person arrived in some trepidation to find out if I can see Miss Ambridge again tonight for a few minutes, 
it is most important that i should do so as i shall be compelled to leave the hall very early in the morning mrs herring had a shrewd suspicion of the state of things between her young mistress and the handsome gentleman who came so often from london and this rather astonishing request confirmed everything certainly sir she said and disappeared five minutes afterward edith ambridge entered the library her eyes wide open with surprise and a smile of greeting for her lover all ready to break over her face but a glance at him dispelled it instantly why oh charles what has happened leslie took her hand and turning away his face from her gaze he said in a hoarse voice i sent for you dear to tell you something that must not be put off please believe that what i am going to say is right and best however hard it may seem i am ruined a telegram has just come telling me so practically life is to begin all over again for me and i shall be chained to an office in the city for many years even if the best happens i cannot ask you to share such a life as i must lead i love you too well that's all forgive me for speaking so it will be easier to part now than later god bless you for all <laughs> but a great sob choked him here and he turned away and buried his face in his hands for a moment edith looked at him in silence then she laid her hands on his shoulders and said softly look at me love leslie raised his head and saw that her great eyes were running over with tears but that her whole face was lighted up by a proud smile in joy but not in sorrow she said slowly in success but not in misfortune in better but not in worse it is you that i love what else do i know and closing her arms she drew him tenderly to her till his head was pillowed upon her breast then she whispered as she kissed his pale forehead no my love i will not let you go little remains to tell early the next morning sunday leslie's chief clerk arrived at ambridge hall leslie himself had not slept at all during the night and was downstairs in a few minutes after the man's arrival had been announced to him his clerk was standing in the recessed window of the library looking out into the garden and as leslie entered hurriedly pale from the shock he had received and lack of sleep he turned and said cheerily good morning sir you must have had a bad quarter of an hour yesterday yesterday replied leslie in a low voice what do you mean why when you got my telegram about what bosch preferred but it's all right sir that's what i've come to tell you nothing has really happened leslie drew a long breath and steadied himself against the table tell me has there been no panic i don't understand oh yes replied the clerk with the importance that the possession of a piece of news always confers there was a very lively time in americans just before the market closed i was getting ready to go home when a man from jones brothers rushed into the office and told me they had just got a cable telling them that the Watbosch Railroad had been discovered to be insolvent and the preferred stock had fallen twenty-five points in New York. Well, you may imagine my feelings. Of course, in your absence, I could do nothing, but I went across the way and for a quarter of an hour there was such a time in Americans as I never saw in my life. As soon as I could get away afterward, I cabled to New York about it and a dozen others did the same thing. I waited at the office for a reply but it didn't come until the telegraph office here had closed and there was no train by which i could reach you that night the whole story he went on unbuttoning his coat and producing a bundle of papers from his pocket is a fraud there's been no discovery in new york and what bosch preferred went up two points in wall street yesterday but nobody knows yet how the report got over here some scoundrelly american dodge i'll be bound this is the reply i got from new york all right said leslie with a strange tremor in his voice never mind that now i'll talk it over with you later will you ring and ask them to give you some breakfast and he opened the long window and passed out into the fresh morning air an hour later edith ambridge woke to find upon her pillow a handful of harebells with a dew still on them and a little note containing these words yesterday's alarm was all false 
you alone were true, my brave, sweet love. She kissed the words and fell asleep again, and when her maid entered a second time, she found her mistress still sleeping sweetly, with the pale blue flowers pressed to her lips. As for Tate, he found a telegram waiting for him at the first port at which the Nirvana touched after heading south, summoning him instantly to London. But before he reached there, he knew all. Leslie's accidental absence had saved him from the fatal sail upon which Tate had counted, and the only effect of the message the latter had dispatched with so much ingenuity and danger had been to prove to his rival the depth of the love he had won. Mr. Silk, however, had obeyed orders like a soldier, and had bought heavily, right and left, but out of eight who had sold, five could not bear the enormous loss they had to meet immediately, and failed to meet their engagements. Forced to settle, Tate himself lost every penny he had in the world, and after all, the hammer fell before his name. The secret of the lightning, however, has never been divulged, and the advertisements of a broker, with an artificially alliterative name appearing now constantly in the papers, and inviting the unwary to join all kinds of attractive syndicates and operations, are Tate's attempts, aided to the last by faithful old silk, to retrieve at least enough of a position to give him leisure to spend a day in the country occasionally, and yield himself up to daydreams of what he still believes might well have been. This was the last story told on board the Bavaria. Early next morning, a steamer was sighted off the Port Bow, which proved to be one of the largest vessels of a rival line. In response to signals for assistance, she soon drew up alongside, and the first officer of the Bavaria boarded her to negotiate terms for towing. After some time had been spent in reconciling the views of the two commanders, an agreement was made, and an hour later the Bavaria was once more making her way rapidly toward New York. It would be of little interest to narrate in detail all that happened while the ships were in company. The experience was a novel and interesting one to the passengers, but its only relation to the present narrative lies in the fact that it effectually put a stop to the gatherings of the little party belonging to the captain's table. Nothing occurred to cause further delay, and at breakfast on the third day, the welcome word went round the tables that the hook had been passed at daylight. At lunchtime, the passengers were enjoying the beautiful sail up New York Harbour, and after that it was not long before the party disappeared from each other's sight in the jaws of the custom house with many a hearty shake of the hand, and many a good wish and congratulation that delay had been tampered by such memorable pleasures. The eminent tragedian and Beatrice proceeded to fresh triumphs. The novelist gladdened the heart of his family and the pleasure-loving society of Newport for a while. The romancer went west and squatted, and everyone who loves good reading knows the delightful things that happened to him there. The editor and the critic and the rest followed duty and pleasure as fortune gave them opportunity, but the tales in mid-ocean still remain unique in the memory of all. To one of the party has it at last been permitted to gather them together with a few words of his own for a wider circle. The End End of Section 8 Recording by Ulrike Denis End of The Broken Shaft Tales in Mid-Ocean Edited by Henry Norman